Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Recap. I'm with George Jackson. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Nice to see you again. Uh, so what have you been up to? Tell me a little bit about the tour. I think the last thing you did was a tour before coming back to London. That's right. So we actually tried to have this conversation about two or three weeks ago. Yeah. Um, but the problem was I was at, at that point I was in France, mm -hmm. um, in Rouen, in Normandy, and I had the worst internet connection in the world at that point. So I thought maybe it would be safer to store it all up and wait till I get back to London. But I'm now back at home in London. Um, I had two projects back to back uh, over the last five weeks. So the first one was, as I said, in France, in uh, the Opéra de Rouen, um, you, just the orchestra. Um, so not, not working with singers or any of the chorus, but just the orchestra of the opera. Um, and we, we did four concerts throughout the region. So we traveled throughout Normandy um, over, over two weekends. So I had quite a bit of time off in between. But it was interesting because um, the minute I arrived, so I took the train from, from London to Paris, the minute I arrived, typically, um, I got a call from the orchestra saying that they cha they're changing the program. We had to discuss changing the program um, because they decided that because we were playing in various different sizes of, of venues, some churches, some halls, we had a problem with making sure that we had all the spacing requirements between players, but especially between strings and woodwind or strings and brass. So we decided to, to formulate a new program just as I got on the other side of the, uh, of the English Channel. Um, and so the new program, we, we basically had just strings, mm. just woodwinds, and then a very small Mozart concerto. So the original program was um, the Beethoven Violin Concerto with a, a Ukrainian violinist who's based in Berlin uh, called Diana Tyshenko, mm -hmm. who, who was fabulous. Um, so Beethoven Violin Concerto with Mozart Hafner Symphony, keeping the kind of D major theme. Um, and then uh, at the beginning with the Ruins of Athens Overture. So I thought it would be quite nice to do a more unknown Beethoven overture, mm -hmm. um, you know, with context of, of better known pieces. Of course, the minute that, that we, we set the program and everything, we changed the program, um, ended up with Dvorak Serenade for Strings, okay. which is beautiful. Um, it. it was so lovely to, yeah, it's just, and it's, and every, there's everything in the piece, you know, you can find all the different parts of Dvorak's language is all there throughout. So it was really nice to do that. Um, you know, it felt like a bit of a, a jump in because it was all quite last minute. But we did that with the, with, the, with, uh, with Diana, the same violinist. And we started the concert with the Gounod Petite Symphony, uh, mm -hmm. just for winds, which was really nice. So we sort of, it was a kind of a French theme at the, at the beginning, then through and then um, ending up with Dvorak. So it was a nice, it was a nice program that we chose. And actually, one of the things I noticed about the program was that all of those composers have a very strong relationship with London, mm -hmm. um, you know, Gounod and Dvorak especially. And so it was, it was almost, it felt to me the kind of unity although it was a last minute thing, the unity was actually that there was this idea of, you know, these, these European composers that had spent a lot of important time living in London uh, and then of course going back. So that was quite nice. And obviously Dvorak, um, not just London, but of course with the United States as well. Um, yeah. So it was almost a homage to the inability to travel through, through a concert program, you know. So, uh, so how important is it to have some kind of a, theme for a program because sometimes you know you mentioned uh you you come up with a theme things fall apart you have to in this situation you have you have a, a different program but then you still find some kind of a connection in these composers how important is it to have some kind of a connection to all the pieces or composers for you or just for the type of work that you do or programming well i think a lot of what we do and we put something on on the stage even if it's a concert um you know there's a narrative there there's a storytelling arc that's happening mm -hmm. so i think what's really important to me is that even if we have just thrown together pieces which which you know we have in the library and we're ready to go with it, that still the narrative arc you have to find what the arc is and think about what that represents in the whole evening um you know i think that's important you know it's same reason why we watch netflix or or why we watch a, a film you know there, there's a story being told um you know it's never just three pieces or four pieces kind of slung together so that's important i think um sometimes i don't know i've always found that it's it's there's a kind of a natural feeling of intuition of what fits with what um and i imagine um so i mean i don't want to start talking about food already <laughs> but actually what's interesting is but, you know, I'm sure that there are chefs out there who, you know, they know that with the salmon, you know, the, the quinoa fits perfectly. So that's just, and they could try and explain why, but actually there's probably a natural intuition of what goes with what. And so I think, I think a lot of, 
maybe not just conductors, but all musicians, in fact, they, they think they all have a natural affinity with what, what fits together, you know. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a shame because you do see programs where you can see what the thought process was, you know, um, you know the, the all Spanish program or, you know, or whichever it might be. Mm -hmm. And that's nice. But I also think sometimes it's quite exciting to, to hide the link between the pieces mm -hmm. a little bit. So, you know, <clears throat> so that one classic example, um, you know, yes, it was a coincidence that, that those pieces came together like they did, but actually there is something behind the piece, which or behind the three pieces, which creates the impression and creates the idea that actually there is something to be told within, within the story. And I think, I think that's important, and especially now that we're, you know, we're, we're always battling to find concert audiences, but actually, um, you know, we, we're never just doing a concert. We're writing program notes. We're about the concert mm -hmm. we're often speaking from the stage i tend to do a lot more of that in the united states talking to the audience from the stage for example and actually it's, it's lovely to be able to share you know why are you performing this piece in this town you know you, you get that sense of relationship so um i think that's important and i think programming is really creative it, it's like coming up with a tasting menu you know it's the same kind of idea yeah yeah and uh, you, you talk a lot about food but i also see a nice drink uh, collection back there tell me a little bit about that yeah i know i realize maybe it's maybe it's not not good but no i just have a few have a like every british person i have a nice nice gin um fire gin which is a london gin and then um have a have a lefroig um which is a very nice scotch whiskey which i quite like um but i don't i don't touch them very often it's you know special occasions <laughs> um you know, something about programming and during this time, uh, you see a lot of conductors or music administrators try to program various pieces for smaller orchestra. Are there some pieces that you've seen on programs, whether it's you or others, where you're like, oh, I, you pr I probably wouldn't have conducted that, probably uh, wouldn't have seen that on the program if it wasn't for COVID? Because, you know, it's a, a smaller instrumentation and you usually work with bigger orchestras. Have there been some pieces that you've seen uh, on programs that you didn't expect? you wouldn't you wouldn't see otherwise um i think probably not not necessarily pieces specifically but i think that there's definitely been a resurgence in individual groups of orchestras doing concerts together um some of the first concerts i saw back in june where paris had started to open up i went to see the um the radio philharmonique um in in paris um all strings program for example and I think that, so there's, so in a way it's quite nice because we've often, if you're, if you're doing a concert program with a full orchestra, whether it's a salaried orchestra or a per service orchestra, you know, you don't always have the luxury to just have the strings. You know, um, if you're the, if you're the music director that does, that decides that that month's concert is just strings, then you've got a lot of very, very angry woodwind players and brass players who don't work that month. For example, if, if, yeah. if it's that kind of orchestra. Um, and at the same time, you know, if you've got a tuba player on salary and you're not using them for a couple of months, it's also the same kind of thing. So I think we're always restricted in our ability to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I've found that actually there's, there's an incredible amount of repertoire, particularly actually just when I talk about just strings. Um, one, of the, one of the next projects I have in London is an all string program. Mm -hmm. And you kind of realize that, for example, the genre of string serenade um, you know, this idea of a sort of outdoor evening performance of string music. You know, you can almost go through a lot of music history just with the feeling of the, mm -hmm. or at least by nationality, you know, so we're doing the Elgar string serenade. Mm -hmm. um, this time, not the Dvorak, but of course you have the Dvorak, you have the Tchaikovsky. I mean, there, there's an amazing sense of actually, you might have to really fight hard to do these pieces on a full concert program, whereas now we're, we're encouraged to do it. Um, and I think also, you know, we talk about chamber orchestras or, or new music style ensembles. Um, it's actually quite nice to have almost like a straight jacket of, mm -hmm. right, you, here's what you have to do. Your task is you're only allowed the strings for the first half, only the woodwinds for the second half, um, you know, come up with the program. And I think I've personally, I've really enjoyed the creativity of, of having that restriction mm -hmm. because we're all, when someone says to you, especially as a young conductor, when someone says, okay, we're doing the Mozart Violin Concerto number no. five, um, you can choose the rest of the program. That level of freedom is also quite dangerous for a young conductor because, you know, you want to conduct everything, but you also want to conduct things that you know very well, that you've done a lot. 
so actually the the restriction of of what you what you might be able to find in the repertoire mm. it's amazing i found some phenomenal pieces um particularly actually living composers as well um you know and i think putting those things together is it's a big responsibility that, that this allows us to do yeah and uh, you know all this time with so many european orchestras uh they they seem to find some kind of projects to keep going to keep trying and even if it's limited audience or most of the time it is all of the time probably uh but in the us it's kind of not been the same and mm -hmm. I, I keep thinking about our conversation with state sponsored orchestras or government supported orchestras and the us where you know uh it's not really government supported it's not supported by the government so um i just keep thinking about that and it seems like in this particular situation you know and you you, you said that you really like from what i remember you said you really like you know the 50 50 balance of you know um you know state and local support or people supporting the orchestras i just keep thinking you know the europeans have it a bit better at the moment at least for this particular situation with still being able to go because it is tough in the us to not have the support because they rely so much on ticket sales and sponsorships and they've lost so much of that that they can't even do the small little performances i think it would make it really difficult for them to keep the mus musicians on salary and keep the organization running with you know limited funding i uh, any other thoughts uh, about all of this any anything anything that you've seen that or maybe that uh, we could have tried in the us with whatever we have or uh, things that you see that are working for better or for worse in the UK or in Europe with the government support? Well, I think this idea of um, what they call box office exposed, mm -hmm. which is in a way the the biggest, well, it, it's the biggest hindrance in this sort of environment because, you know, again, to go back to analogy, you know, it's like having a business, a, a shop or a restaurant where, you know, let's let's imagine that nobody's allowed to come to the restaurant but you still have to open every evening and prepare the meals with the full staff. Um, you know, to, to use that analogy, um, like regarding the way that we prepare an orchestra, yeah, it doesn't make sense to, you know, what we do is dependent upon people coming and we're, we're a live performing art, which um, to some extent is, you know, it's showbiz, you know, it, it has to be consumed by people who see it. Um, but at the same time, it's also culture. Um, and you know whether you want to call it high culture or or medium culture or just or high art, it, you know, regardless of what happens, it's um, it's something which is an uninterrupted thread, you know, that hasn't ever kind of stopped in terms of the way it's developed historically, and so you can't you can't completely capitalize culture in in that in that way. So again, as I said before, that's why for me it's it has to be both the respect of the culture and what it represents yeah. whilst at the same time accepting that you know it, it we shouldn't be in the business of of you know having no audience members and just doing a concert um you know but at the same time if you know if you think about art galleries um i imagine that they're obviously it's a very different you know they're not thinking about things in terms of real time mm -hmm. but you know they're not so dependent upon entrance fees you know, the, the art is there and you go in and witness it. Mm. And I think with orchestras, in a way, that's probably how, how the European model is thinking. Mm. Actually, you have an orchestra, the orchestra is rehearsing, and then the orchestra is putting on some concerts. And that's happening. And we'll do what we can to let people come and be part of that. Mm. Um, and I think that's probably where they are with it. I mean, in terms of specifically this tour that I just did, um, you know, it's, it's a... Um, the organization is heavily funded by the local region of Normandy. Um, and so it, in a way, it's almost, it's like running water to the community there. You know, it's not, um, it's not a luxury. It's something which everybody who lives and pays their taxes in Rouen, they're entitled, or in Normandy, they're entitled to have a performance from their local orchestra once a month or once every six months. Um, and so I think the responsibility is also to those people um, because they're paying their tax, which by default means that they're actually funding the orchestra themselves. Um, I think what's interesting in the United States and also in the UK is that there is a very strong feeling that the arts, but particularly orchestras and say opera houses and, and that, those kind of activities, they're luxurious activities. Mm. Um, you know, the economy for them is based on the idea of luxury. So I suppose you could compare them to 
you know, a Louis Vuitton handbag, for example, you know, or, or something in the fashion industry. It's, it's a luxury brand. Um, and so in a way, the question is, how do you treat something that you, you would consider a luxury? I, I think that it's important to always go to the theatre or go to see an orchestra with the feeling that it's something very special and it's something that's, that's very, very high to kind of be attained. Um, and it's not just a, you know, a plastic carrier bag that you, that you bring home from the supermarket. Um, and so I think, again, it's, I, it, I don't think I want to work in a system that's both. I think I enjoy transitioning between both sides of the way that the arts are funded um, because you, you start to identify the positive things and the negative things in both. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, behind all of that is just musicians who want to play music. Yeah. Um, and that's, in, in a way, that's the important thing yeah. uh, at the end of it all. Well, in the Soviet Union, uh, it was state-sponsored, obviously, and it worked so well for so many uh, areas, but then it didn't work well for, you know, composers, for example. You know, composers that are well-known now, for example, uh, the obvious one that comes to mind, Shostakovich, but there's a long list of other composers who didn't even have that success or people don't even remember them now. Uh, mm. And they've kind of been lost because, you know, the Soviet Union kind of... Uh, had you know set rules and regulations for what a composition should be what what what, what it um, what should be presented to the public you know uh, and there was the composers union which kind of regulated everything that was happening uh, and you couldn't be too forward thinking i guess if you know in, in, in some ways um is there and i don't know because i don't really work with european orchestras but is there a government kind of intervention uh, with arts organizations as far as composers and I guess maybe this might be like a very administrative question in some ways but is there uh, government intervention and in what the what the organizations should do or who they should com uh, commission uh, who they should perform or not to perform have you seen anything like that with uh, uh, art uh, government funded institutions in Europe I mean I know that often you have probably not direct intervention as far as I know, but for example, in the appointment of maybe music director or intendant or director of an opera, for example, often their appointments done by a local council mm. or, you know, like a government committee, which might not necessarily be composed of musicians, for example. So I've seen a lot of occasions where, for example, let's say um, a German opera house has decided that they're looking for a new music director, um, often, the you're applying not to the opera house but to the council to the local council of that city so the appointment comes through the essentially through the government so the, i think there's certainly there's certainly that type of in intervention um you know I, I mean could you imagine you know the the white house or the kind of local senator being involved in the music director search of, of the orchestra you know it's, it's so there's that kind of involvement um but i think the, the thing is i think a lot of the in terms of the government that the general feeling is not that different from the United States. The idea really is that by choosing somebody who is an artistic leader of, of that organization, you're entrusting that person with essentially the, the budget and the artistic planning of that organization. Um, and so I think that generally speaking, uh, the audience, because I think what for, what's important for us is we need to come up with programming and with pieces that we do um, to make sure that an audience comes. You know, there's, there's always that balance. Whereas I know that there are situations where, you know, if, if, uh, if, if an opera house or an orchestra have, you know, free reign over what they do in terms of their funding, they don't need to think about the audience, um, which is exciting in the sense that they can program an all Stockhausen evening, um, you know, perhaps, or they could hire a, a stage director who's decided that they want to do, you know, the Marriage of Figaro on the moon with you know whatever it might be the, the the level of freedom is there in terms of like high experimentation but that can affect the box office so there's less of that sort of responsibility that comes from the public you know again i i think that that it's important to to find the line between both because the last thing you want is lots and lots of audience members and patrons complaining that they keep playing lots of modern music you know what you read about historically the responses to Schoenberg's music in Vienna for example you know that those kinds of things um the number of times I used to go to the Musikverein 
went to the to the main concert hall in Vienna and watched people just walk out. You know, older audience members just walk out because they didn't like the program. Um, you know, you have to find a way to balance so that people aren't walking out of what you're offering them uh, because you know that's that's not always a good thing. I, I was going to ask about things that you've seen that have been used well during this time uh, because there's so many orchestras that are not playing, but they're sort of doing virtual things that are happening, various programs for youth orchestras or even professional orchestras are uh, doing various things. Uh, have you seen anything that's worked well? Uh, have you have you noticed anything that's really worked well, whether it's a lecture series or, you know, some of these online, you know, um, uh, conversations that they've had or any of what the or organizations have given to their communities and to the world. Anything that comes to mind that you've seen that has worked well during this time, uh, especially the past month or so that we haven't talked? Yeah, well, I think what's what's been really interesting is that um, because, you know, conductors and soloists and artists haven't been performing to an audience as much, um, we've all been doing more talking and engaging in conversations and things than before. Mm -hmm. So I think one, one of the things I've seen quite continuously throughout the lockdown, um, but even continuing now, is I think artists are a bit more involved in, in actually talking, you know, one-on-one -on -one conversation or talking to, to other colleagues publicly and whether it's video, whether it's a podcast, um, because actually you realise that when you're flying around the place rehearsing and conducting concerts and doing things, you know, you never have time to actually sit down and have long conversations about you know in the style that we're doing mm -hmm. um, and actually what's really important is um, this sort of demystification of what conductors do I think is a really important thing because it's you know to any audience member and actually to be honest to any orchestral player sometimes as well they have no idea what we do yeah. and you know it's in everybody's interest to know what what first of all for an orchestra's interest to know what the conductor's doing or trying to do mm -hmm. um you know i have i have fantastic long conversations with with players in orchestras about what what they think and what i think this job is and you know it's and that's fascinating and so i feel like we've we've got to a nice point of dialogue obviously also a very global dialogue you know we can talk across across the atlantic and that's it's easy um and i think that if that stays, the sort of introspection of what it is that we do, um, I think that will be that will be a positive that comes out of things, you know, yeah. and also in combination in combination with what we do. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you a couple of tough tough questions. One is what? Uh, how would you explain what a conductor does to someone who has who is not a musician, someone just who knows, you know, a couple of things about orchestra, but is really not connected with the orchestral or music world. How would you, how would you explain what a conductor does in a couple of sentences? We're the referee that also plays, if wow. you know what I mean. Wow. So, so in some way, we're responsible for what you might call the, the sort of everyday discipline of what goes on in the game, right? Mm -hmm. So checking the people are playing the right notes, checking that people are playing the right dynamics, checking that we're all on the same page. Um, when I say that we're playing, you know, we're not actually touching the ball, as it were, the ball being sound, if, if you want. Um, so it's, it's that, you know, and it's, and I think also you, you can, the sports and metaphor is fantastic because if you think about people playing sports for, you know, 90 minutes in, in soccer, for, mm -hmm. for example, um, Think about the work that's gone on in their training beforehand and think, think about the fact that the manager who trains them or, or, or well, I mean, the manager's one thing, but the referee um, is also training and is also part of the cultivation of mm -hmm. how they all play. So in that respect, there's much more going on behind the scenes than there is that you see in, in the game. And in a way, that's probably the nearest thing. Um, obviously, it's non-competitive, so there's that aspect makes it more difficult. But essentially, we're... We, we're sort of there to just kind of keep an eye on everything and, and be involved when we need to be and then step back when we need to be. Um, and so I think people who, are, who, who, who see sports. That was great. I actually have never heard anyone explain it the way you did. One more question, again, a tough one. Mm -hmm. Young musician, you know, started playing in the orchestra for a year or two, says, hey, um, George, tell me what does a conductor do? I've been seeing you waving your arms, telling me what to do for a couple of years now. But what is it you really do? We could have played this thing on our own. Well, that's the point that we, we all know they can play it on their own. 
you know, that I think I think the idea that they can't is is a ridiculous thing. I mean, they they can play it on their own, but the point is is that your job is to make it easier for them to play it on their own. You know, that than than it would be playing on their own. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's hard, isn't it? Because when you I suppose when you when you look physically at what we do, you think, okay, well, I suppose you're you're managing time maybe in its simplest sense. You're you're responsible for working out, okay, so it's 7.30, we've got a concert, the conductor's on stage, the conductor's the person that basically decides, okay, when do we start the piece? How slow or fast is the piece going to be? Um, when do we finish the piece? How much of a silence do we get at the end of the piece before it's the end? You know, all, all those things. I think, in a way, that's purely about timing. Um, it, you know, you could think of it in dramatic terms where it's, it's just about what you're doing with this, you know, the stretching of the of the time over an evening, um, but in that respect, you're. I think the word controlling. You see, that's the thing. And I've heard, I've heard people talk about. People think that if you're a pilot, I think this is something that Herbert von Karajan used to talk about because he was he was a famously flew planes, um, and I think he used to say that it looks like there's a lot of power mm. and sort of you know authority in flying a plane. But actually, you're, you're, not, you're using nature and you're using the natural kind of the energy of what's going on in the air and the way the plane works to just guide it through. So, so it looks like power, but it's not. You're actually just allowing things to happen in, in a way and helping them happen. Um, because a lot of people, yeah, they, always, they, see, a, you know, they see somebody with a, with a baton at the front and, you know, it's, it looks like it could be a weapon, you know, for example. You know, people say... And maybe it, maybe it could be a weapon, but it's not, it's not a powerful thing. And I, and I also think that most conductors I know, some do, I'm sure, I don't think conductors get into it because they want to have a sense of power. Yeah. Because actually we all know that if you stand in front of an orchestra, um, you can lose power, you know, immediately. That They have the power, you know, that you know that they're, they're in control of what's going on. You're, you know, you're just... I mean, I, it's interesting. I had a conversation today about... Um, working with a new music ensemble Mm -hmm. and we were sort of talking about the difference between being a music director and being a guest conductor Mm -hmm. not in terms of administrative or anything but the the psychology behind it um and actually in a way it's a bit like i I was explaining to them it's like going around to somebody's house Mm -hmm. and you know they've invited you in for a cup of tea and you're not going to go in you're going to you're not going to move the furniture you're not going to put new wallpaper up you're not going to change the the fittings you're, you're going to enjoy their space. You're going to have a cup of tea and you're going to kind of interact with them socially. And hopefully they enjoyed your trip and they'd like you to come for another cup of tea in a couple of years or next week. And so I think once you de- deconstruct the idea that it's just standing in front with the baton, it's, it's almost all of those things at the same time. Cause you know, you're not, you're not their boss. It's not the old days of a music director sort of being the only conductor. It's not like that either. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's many different things. And, if, and you want, you know, if you don't want to be back as a guest, you could walk in and say, "Hey, I want this tea." Oh, this is terrible tea. I didn't like the tea. Get yeah, yeah, exactly. House. Yeah. And uh, actually, where you put uh, where, where you have the furniture, I'm gonna move it a little bit because I want to be I want to be comfortable. And yeah. uh, you might not yeah. be back as a guest. Uh, most likely, you won't be back as a guest. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Uh, so the goal. The goal. Sorry to interrupt you. The goal is not to just go get invited back. I mean, that's not what it comes down to. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, is that you're, at the end of the day, you're also a musician. Whether you make a sound or not, it's irrelevant. You're, you're a musician and your job is to be involved in the music making of lots of interesting people. And that's, you know, it's just commu- communication of that. Yeah. You know? And you could push it a little bit, though. If you're a music director, you come in, you walk into the ha- uh, you walk into the space, they offer you tea, but they don't like, the, you, they, they don't have sugar on the table and you like your tea with some sugar. You could yeah. ask for some and push it a little bit. So as a, uh, as a guest conductor, maybe you have some space to push them a little bit, but not really just be too crazy with it. <laughs> no, that's it. Yeah, it is. It, but it's the most human interaction, actually, yeah. when, when it comes down to it. It's, it's a human interaction. Yeah. And the more you relate the job to, to uh, you know, because also in a sort of, in a democratic way, you've got, you've got all these people on stage who do completely different things. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got someone playing the contrabassoon, you know, and then someone playing the violin. I mean, it couldn't be more different in terms of things that people are doing. So how, you know, your job is to be the person that allows those two like 
different animals to interact with each other and to play music. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's that, it's that kind of simple in a way, but, yeah. but also mysterious. Yeah. I've never asked you this. Well, I don't think I've ever asked you this, but uh, because we, we had, you know, at least six or five or six conversations at this point. Yeah. I don't know. I've lost track, but um, what is a composer from the past no longer alive they would love to collaborate with you know you wish they were around so you could you know at least email them a question or something is there someone from the past that you're just so uh connected with um that you would love to have at least a conversation or a collaboration maybe it's i to be honest i think that there's that thing of you know never meet your heroes mm -hmm. i think i'd be terrified of meeting someone and them being not very interesting or not very nice mm -hmm. um but i think i would like to hang out with haydn because because i think he was he seemed to have been a really interesting probably quite quite witty quite funny mm -hmm. but, but interesting and very educated kind of guy mm -hmm. um and so that i that would be my choice but in terms of in terms of sort of asking questions and things like that i mean i think the list is just endless mm -hmm. um and i think i'd be emailing them far too much and so it's probably not a good idea. Um, what I would like to know is, you know, for example, I'm, I'm currently preparing a Mozart opera, um, you know, and you, and you, look at, you look at the opera and you look at the text and you, and you think about the high standards of playing and performance that we have today. I, I'd just love to sort of say to, if Mozart was, was answering my emails, to say to him, you know, do, isn't it weird that we're doing your opera? you know, however many hundreds of years, do you think it's weird? And is it, is it in any way like how you did it when you did it at the Burg Theater or whatever mm -hmm. it might be? Um, I just love to know that. Um, that would be very interesting. But on, on a simple level, it's interesting because now, you know, when in, in the end of the 18th century, going into the 19th century, generally, they were playing music of, that was fresh off the page that was happening now, you know, so the, the idea of a culture where we, we basically play music of, of 300 years ago. I think that might be a bit alien to someone like Mozart. Yeah. Um, less someone like Mendelssohn, who was so involved in reviving Bach and, and that kind of thing. But certainly it must have been quite strange, the idea of, you know, okay, we're not good. You know, I, I imagine he would say, well, have you not got any good operas now? You know, and then that's a whole other debate. <laughs> but... <laughs> uh, is there a living composer? And I think we talked about this briefly uh, in a different podcast, but... Uh, is there a living composer that you you would want to collaborate with and work with? Well, I, I mean, I've been working a lot on some of Steve Reich's mm -hmm. like newer works. Um, I wouldn't say, I mean, I suppose we've collaborated in the sense that I've done a lot of premieres of, of his on this side of the the pond, um, and I've enjoyed exchanging with him messages, and you know, I've, that's been great. Um, I think there, are, I mean, there are loads of great composers. I think um, I'd love to. A composer who I love actually is, is Chris Theophanidis, who you know very well. Mm -hmm. And um, we've always worked together in the capacity of me conducting works by his students. Mm -hmm. um, or at one point, actually, I was the assistant conductor on his opera uh, a couple of years ago. But actually, I'd, I'd love to work with him on a, either on a new piece or on one of, one of his pieces and just be really involved um, because, you know, he's such a great, gen you know, generous guy. And also I love his music. <laughs> Yeah, and so that combination would be really nice. A um, couple more questions. One of them is something uh, we've been talking here in the U.S. Um, for a couple of months now is the blind auditions. Uh, yeah. And I think again, uh, at this point, uh, I'm sorry to the guests who are listening to this a second time, and they're like, "Oh, you asked that question uh, before," yeah. but uh, I think it's still great to come back with some questions. Uh, what What is it? What What's done in the U.K. with auditions, auditioning for an orchestra spot, and um, w what are your feelings about blind auditions or behind the screen auditions? So we, we also use blind auditions, um, as far as I know, generally, um, but then we also have very long trial periods as well. So it's never, you never get the job, you know, you're, you're always then on trial, often you'll be on trial, a rotation of people will be on trial for quite a long time. So I wouldn't say that it's done exclusively on, on blind auditions. Um, mm -hmm. I think blind auditions are, are obviously ha were significant because, you know, you, from the gender perspective, you know, you didn't have as many women in orchestras mm -hmm. and then they did blind auditions and then you did. So <laughs> regardless of what anyone says, um, blind auditions make it 
purely a meritocracy. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that's a fantastic thing, especially when so many things in music probably aren't a meritocracy. Uh, I think it's, it's a brilliant thing. But having said that, um, I can also understand the idea that, you know, we're, we are a visual art form, you know, we're in some way, it's, and it's not that when you, when you choose an orchestra, it's not that you're casting in the way that you do in opera or in the way that you do in a theater, um, like in, in regular spoken theater, but actually we also have to be aware that it is, it is an on stage, you know, visual art form as well as an, an audible art form. Um, but, but actually what's more important with an orchestra is you just have to get the best people. And I think, I think blind auditions fulfill that. And that's, that's great. Well, thank you so much, George. Anything else you want to add before we end? The time always flies with us talking. I know we could talk for hours. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's great. It's, it's really fabulous to, to chat. And um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask which composer you, and to turn it around, who would you want to talk to by email? Uh, a, a, a composer that's no longer around. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's actually, well, one that's I've just been passionate about for a long time and I wish he was around and he actually didn't even uh, pass um, uh, uh, too long ago, but uh, someone who I think just deserves to be, have his music performed more often, uh, especially at least in his homeland is Abed de Terian, uh, okay. uh, Armenian composer and he was, he's, he's known for his symphonies. And, yeah. uh, uh, and he also was such a master of incorporating Armenian folk instruments in his music. And mm-hmm. I just th- don't think he got um, as much attention during the Soviet time because he, he, he was a bit of an unusual figure, mm-hmm. especially with his composition. I, I just think, I, I think he just deserves a bit more attention. And w- one thing that makes me even more uh, sad or upset in some ways is that I wish he was performed more, at least in his homeland of Armenia. And, and that's not even as, you know, mm-hmm. um, that's not even happening as much. I hope, I hope to conduct some of his works in the future. And actually on my um, uh, podcast, I was a guest on Podium Time, which is another fantastic podcast. And you've been a guest with them. Uh, um, Jeremy asked me the same similar question, I think. Uh, and I, I told him about Abed Tertelian. And I think I, I sent him a link to uh, Abed Tertelian's Third Symphony. And it's uh, linked to the podcast. So uh, for Okay, those- well, no, that'd be, I'd be really interested yeah. to hear yeah. that. Because also, although you say that it's important for him to be performed in his hometown. Actually, I'd argue the opposite. I think it would be more important for him to be performed outside his yeah, hometown. Yeah, well, so, that would be a, a great, uh, a great moment for him to be performed outside. But uh, what I meant is that I, I just wish that at least people who, where he grew up, or where he was, you know, uh, where he lived, appreciated him a little bit more. But uh, it's all right. Uh, hopefully, yeah. he'll be performed more in the future. Thanks so much. Yeah. Any pleasure. Anything else, George? No, no. I, I hope everyone's starting the the new season, September, October, very well. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, funny how quickly the summer went. Yeah. Have a beautiful day, and we'll we'll I'll see you soon next month. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.